I am Hanna Aidi, uh, co-founder of Dunya Productions. We're a local company here in Seattle. Um, we do theater to inspire and impassion our audience to join in into the struggle for uh, social and political uh, justice. Um, we are um, a, a company, um, mostly members of uh, Middle Eastern background and um, some Americans. Uh, uh, most of our work is about the Middle East and uh, North Africa. Um, we started uh, with a couple virtual projects. So the first project, Letters from Palestine in the time of uh, the virus. Uh, these were letters that we received from people uh, in Gaza how they were dealing um, with the pandemic. Uh, we got it directly from people who uh, were writing to the world to basically explain how they were dealing with it. And we did some editing to it and we um, performed it um, uh, virtually. And then the second project, uh, Loved Ones, uh, has to do with uh, families that had uh, brothers and sisters and fathers who were uh, prisoners in Israeli jails, um, their experience, and then we made that connection with the Palestinian prisoners and the American prisoners from communities like the African American communities and um, kind of uh, created the a similar um, experience between the two communities, the two people. Uh, the Return is a, a, a play written by myself and Edward Mast, a local playwright, and um, it's about um, the, the Palestinian um, oppression and uh, their experience uh, living under the occupation in Israel. Um, we uh, created the show here locally in Seattle and we had to do it during the war after October 7th and we were surprised to fill out the house with people basically elbow to elbow within the theater and move out of the theater into the protest and demonstrations on the street. Uh, the same people who came in to see the play also uh, join in into the struggle outside. Ma'am, my name here is Yaakov, and you're welcome to use it. But I have some work I would really like they to be done today. They always call you Dad. If I can. Yaakov. Yes, ma'am. They never called you Avi. It's you. You're not that hard to find. We can access the records about you people. You know that? Yes, I know that. Oh, peace. Like the Iron Dome? Yes. Like the peace checkpoints and the peace wall and the peace security cameras and the hidden peace microphone. But they keep us safe. You mean it keeps people like me safe from people like you? It keeps everything I have to squash. If I'm going to live for the day, I have to smash it. The war and, and the fight is alive. If I smash them, if I eradicate them, if I work hard and do my job and live my life one minute at a time, then maybe... Do you remember the way we kept our eyes Open. Yes. The way we touched our faces together. I wasn't just the wrong person, I was the wrong kind of person. I was born the wrong kind of person. I felt it in my stomach like a tumor for one instant. I felt that for this little place, this one little refuge in all the world to be ours, you would have to. Not exist.
قد يقر أرضا من غير ذاك المكان ما قد يقل أرضا من غير ذاك المكان وما أوسع القبر من تحت منعون تبغي الوجود ما قد يقل أرضا من غير ذاك المكان وما أوسع القبر من تحت منافذ تبغي الوجود سكبنا على الجرح وردا سكبنا على الجرح وردا سكبنا على الجرح وردا وسرنا إلى خيمة الصنع سرنا وسرنا إلى خيمة الصنع سرنا نصرا يقبل طغر الوريد وسرنا إلى خيمة الصلح سرنا وسرنا إلى خيمة الصلح سرنا نصرا يقبل ثغر الوريد فقبل التفاوت إلى قبرها جثتي فقد ملتي العين فقد ملت العين وانطرى قبرها Hello and Masa al Khair. If you are watching us from Palestine, and Sabah al Khair, if you are in the US, and Ahlan wa Sahlan, if you are watching us from anywhere around the world, and Ramadan Kareem. My name is Hanna Aidi. Um, I am with uh, Dunya Productions. We're based here in Seattle. We are a group of uh, very talented theater artists and activists. Uh, locally here in Seattle. Uh, this program is about Palestine. It's about the West Bank. It's about Gaza. And these are uh, letters that we're going to be reading for you that we have received from uh, friends and families and collected from uh, Palestine, which is the least we could do here at Dunya. Uh, to give voice to our people who are living under occupation in Palestine. We hope that by the end of this pandemic, people around the world will pay a little bit more attention to the ongoing 72 years old of injustice and uh, humanitarian crisis. In, in Palestine. Uh, this program is about 20 minutes of reading these letters, uh, performance by artists and uh, talented people here at Dunya. Uh, and we also have a special guest with us, uh, Ramzi Baroud, who will be updating us 
on the situation in Palestine and also answering uh, questions uh, and any comments that uh, you will be uh, making uh, by basically uh, pressing the the chat button on the on the bottom of your screen. Uh, it's a chat function, and we will be turning this on after the performance. And with that, uh, Dunya Productions presents. Um, I give you letters from Palestine in the time of the virus. Bethlehem is like a ghost town. People are staying indoors. At the Natural History Museum, we met with health officials. We took precautions as needed, but work must go on. Animals have to be fed at the museum garden. Chickens, peacocks, rabbits, hamsters, hawk, fish. So we come every day. Many staff and volunteers work from home. Some of our activities are on hold and money is tight. For most of the people of Bethlehem, this lockdown is hardly their first. Lockdowns and curfews were the status quo in the city during the long years of the Second Intifada. Whether our Israeli neighbors know or care, we have been through some of this before. We have worked from home, we did homeschooling, our sports leagues were frozen, we could not travel, and we were afraid of leaving our houses. Today, I could write a whole book on how we help each other. Not just medical personnel, but police, shop owners, owners of restaurants, and many others who work silently. People donate food, medicines, money, and so forth to help those in quarantine or families of those infected. As of last night, our town of Beit Sahur is under complete curfew. Even shopping for food is prohibited. The emergency committee stated that we can call shops for home delivery. I'm not sure how that would work out since most people need money, which they do not have. And if they do have, it is in the bank and they would need to go to ATMs, which are prohibited. And the banks are closed in the Bethlehem district, so they cannot restock the ATM machines. I also would like to check on needy people and help them but I have to figure out how we can do that under complete curfew. Staff are all at home and we try to do work, though psychologically it is challenging, but we must keep our spirits up. Israel is taking this opportunity to continue its ethnic cleansing and apartheid. Their occupation army even came into Bethlehem dressed in full protective corona gear and arrested three people from their homes. The virus is official in Gaza, where our hospitals are already short on vital medicine and equipment, and people are crowded in like sardines. We've been banned from traveling for 14 years. Cleanliness is difficult when water supplies are contaminated and garbage collection doesn't exist. I have lived all of my 22 years in the tiny besieged Gaza Strip. I have never been allowed to leap. This is the only place I've ever known. I grew up with war, occupation, oppression, and conflict. How could this be worse? But when my 73-year-old uncle refused to shake my hand during a visit, I began to think this might be a different kind of threat. It was almost 1 a.m. when I read the news. The Gaza had identified its first two coronavirus victims. My heart beat rapidly and fear flushed like ice water through my body. I continued to read, but my eyes teared up and everything looked blurred, like a gauzy curtain had suddenly dropped down. I attempted to blink the tears out of my eyes and continue reading. Those two people had returned to Gaza from Pakistan. And although all travelers have immediately been quarantined, no one here trusts that this has kept the infection contained. I was riding in a taxi and the driver remarked on how much his passenger load had already declined with just the fear of the virus hanging over the strip. He was almost in tears when he told me that he had kids and if he doesn't work every day, he won't be able to feed them. My father works as a fabric seller and deals with people all day. His shop is our family's main source of income and each day makes a difference. 
What if we stay home and get infected by the tap water? If the virus enters Gaza, it will be like throwing a gas canister inside a closed room. Everyone inside will breathe it. Infection does not necessarily mean death everywhere, but in Gaza it could be. If one of my kids got infected and no one could help them, only because we are under siege in Gaza, I will lose faith in everything. There are many people who are homeless. Some families are living in a room which they made with some tools which is not safe for saving you from the coronavirus. Those people don't have their basic needs met and they are living beside tons of garbage mountains. For a while there was talk on social media about the benefits of the siege, which I found sort of shocking. Yes, the blockade helped prevent COVID-19 from invading Gaza for days and weeks. But realistically, it was just a matter of time. And this blockade is the reason hundreds and maybe thousands of people here have died because they couldn't get access to proper medical treatment. My own mother has suffered severe pain from trigeminal neuralgia. And while treatments are available elsewhere that could bring her relief, she has no access here. She has told me so many times she'd just rather die. The blockade also is the reason hundreds of Palestinian youths have lost arms and legs in the Great Return March, punished by snipers for protesting their imprisonment. It is the reason why hundreds of extraordinary students lost opportunities to study at foreign colleges and universities because they could not travel. It is the reason why talented Palestinian athletes and artists cannot participate in international workshops and competitions. And it is the reason why our economy is so sick and our unemployment rate is the highest in the world, 70% among young people. The Israeli blockade of Gaza may have protected it temporarily, but now it will prevent us from caring properly for our people. More people will get infected and Gaza will become the world's latest hotspot for coronavirus cases and deaths. And once the world finally gets a vaccine for the virus, Gaza will be the last to get it. When you see pictures of cities with their famous streets empty, remember the Palestinian refugee camps in Gaza and think about what they call their fertile alleyways. I was raised in one of those refugee camps in Rafah called Block J. Nothing in my language can quite describe what the word camp means to me. On one hand, it's the home where I grew up, the place I associate with my friends and neighbors, and the site of the lone fig tree planted by my beloved grandfather, may he rest in peace. But on the other, there is a lack of sunshine due to the closeness of the dull gray concrete walls, the mud in the unpaved alleyways in between because leaking sewage pipes hang overhead, and people peddling everything from Twinkies to tissue in those very same streets, despite the crowding, because that is the only way they can eke out a living. Imagine telling them they must maintain six feet between them if COVID-19 invades. How would they even do that when their homes are so close together with an average of seven people in one 1,500 square foot space? Where will people be isolated? In homes where seven people share a small room without ventilation, without a sink or toilet? And imagine what those other countries would do if they had to manage through this crisis while being controlled by an occupying power, in our case, Israel. In some ways, the coronavirus is like the Israeli army. They both attack innocent people. They both randomly and unexpectedly hit areas heavily populated by civilians. They both scare people and steal their lives. Which is worse? For me, living through an Israeli escalation is much worse. It's more lethal. The Israeli army targets people of all ages and health. 
buildings, animals, plants. Yet the response of the world to the two crises differs dramatically. To the virus, a full-out global mobilization. To Israel's attacks on Gaza, almost no response at all. In Gaza, staying at home isn't enough to protect you. Israeli missiles can just as easily find you there. In Gaza, the first 23 years of my life were lived in virtual lockdown. My father's quarantine was experienced much earlier, as did his father's shelter in place before him. They both died and were buried in Gaza's cemeteries without ever experiencing true freedom outside of their refugee camp in Gaza. As a child, I learned to listen intently to orders barked out by Israeli military officers as they swept through our refugee camp in Gaza, declaring or easing military curfews. Every day, 10 or 15 minutes after the nightly curfew set in, we would hear crackling and hissing of bullets as they whistled through the air from various distances. Automatically, we would conclude that someone, a worker, a teacher, or a rowdy teenager, missed his chance by a few minutes and paid the price for it. Now that nearly half of the population of planet Earth are experiencing some form of curfew or other, we have a few suggestions on how to survive the package, the prolonged confinement, the Palestinian way. Always think ahead and prepare for a longer lockdown than the initial one declared by your city or state. Whenever the Israeli army killed one or more refugees, we knew in advance that mass protests would follow. Thus more killings. In these situations, a curfew was imminent. Number one priority was to ensure that all family members congregated at home or stayed within close proximity so that they could rush in as fast as possible when the caravan of Israeli military jeeps and tanks came thundering, opening fire at anyone or anything within sight. Stay calm. Take control of the situation, do not panic, and assign specific responsibilities to every family member. This strengthens the family unit and sets the stage for collective solidarity desperately required under these circumstances. Typically, my mother would come in, rational and calculating. She would storm the kitchen and assess what basic supplies were missing, starting with the flour, sugar, and olive oil. Knowing that the first crackdown by the Israelis would be on water supplies and electricity, she would fill several plastic containers of water, designating some for tea, coffee, and cooking, and others for dishes and washing clothes. Per her orders, we would rush to nearby stores to make small but necessary purchases, batteries for the flashlight and the transistor radio, cigarettes for my dad, and a few VHS videotapes, which we would watch over and over again whether the crew fee lasted for a few days or a few weeks. Preserve your water. It is easy to feel invincible and fully prepared on the first day of quarantine or military curfew. Many times we live to regret that false sense of readiness as we drank too much tea or squandered our dishwashing water supplies too quickly. Cautiously use your water supplies during quarantine and never under any circumstances drink rainwater or at least keep diarrhea, diarrhea pills handy. Ration your food. Agree in advance on what classifies as essential food and consume your food in a rational way. Also, if you are lucky enough to locate Dutch candy in whatever version of the Abu Sadad store in your town, do not gamble it away in stupid games with your brothers all in one day. Have more than one form of entertainment and be prepared for every eventuality, including at power outages as a form of collective punishment. If electricity is cut off, be ready with alternative options. Books, free wrestling, living room soccer, with the ball preferably made from stuffed up socks contributed by all family members. And of course, candy poker. Find the humor in grim situations. Be funny, don't take life too seriously, 
share a laugh with others, and let humor inject hope in every hour and every day of your quarantine. Gaza is locked up so tight, even a virus can't get it. Gaza is so poor, even a virus would run away scared. During curfew is when you need your sense of humor most. Take things lightly. Laugh at your miserable situation if you must. Forgive yourself for not being perfect, for panicking when you should have been composed, or for forcing your younger brother to gamble his underwear when he runs out of Dutch candy. Let your values guide you during your hours of loneliness. In curfews, we developed a different relationship with God. God became a, a personal and more intimate more intimate companion as we often prayed in total darkness, whispered our verses so very cautiously as not to be heard by pesky soldiers. And even those who hardly prayed before the curfew kept up with all five prayers during the lockdown. What we do have in Gaza is a strong social fabric that holds us together. Our families, our faith, rituals, and traditions, this season, it feels like the generosity of Ramadan is magnified. Despite the risks, youth groups are redoubling their efforts to help families hardest hit. One group contributed their own money and distributed 100 food parcels during the first days of Ramadan. I stand at the balcony singing, we are here. We are here for all of us. That's why we're here. I close my eyes and imagine a friend at the balcony in the city of Milan. Our souls are brought together so we can love each other. Brother, I see my friends Pam and Kevin in the USA at their balconies. Ignore what Trump says. Sing, we are here. We are here for all of us. My friends from Switzerland and Germany, Basel and Frankfurt are singing. Let's talk about our part. My heart touching your heart. Let's talk about living. I've had enough of dying. That's not what we are all about. According to the World Health Organization, 97% of all Gaza's water is not fit for human consumption. Even when it is available, doctors and nurses are unable to sterilize their hands because of the water quality. There are only 62 ventilation devices across Gaza, more than two-thirds of which are already used by other patients. There are only two test kits, enough to examine 190 people. It was five years ago that the United Nations predicted Gaza would be uninhabitable by 2020. The truth is, no amount of preparedness in Gaza, or frankly anywhere in occupied Palestine, can stop the spread of the coronavirus. What is needed is a fundamental and structural change that would emancipate the Palestinian healthcare system from the impact of the Israeli occupation and the Israeli government's policies of perpetual siege and politically imposed quarantines, also known as apartheid. Looking around us, Gazans see people all over the world experiencing what we live every day. Mandatory isolation, unemployment, poverty, rampant illness and death. We take no joy in that. Only hope that once the coronavirus passes and life around the world returns to normal, that people will remember Gaza, still occupied, still isolated but perhaps no longer forgotten. I hope that under no circumstances you will ever hear these ominous words, you are now under curfew, anyone who violates orders will be shot immediately. I also hope that this COVID-19 quarantine will make us kinder to each other and will make us emerge from our homes better people, ready to take on global challenges while united in our common faith, collective pain, and a renewed sense of love for an, our environment. And when it's all over, think of Palestine. For her people have been quarantined for 71 years and counting. 
At 6 a.m., we all line up at the Ofra checkpoint outside Ramallah. I had to leave home at 5 in the morning. The families who come from outside the city had to leave home as early as 3. We've all got our permits and the bus tickets we had to buy at the Red Cross office. For the families outside the city, that was an extra day and night. They had to come through checkpoints to Ramallah and back. We have to be at the checkpoint by 6 a.m. or we miss our chance. We stand in the cold and wait for the checkpoint to open whenever the Israeli soldiers feel like it. A visit from my family is like a lifeline, like breathing. I spend days preparing for it. I shave and I, I comb my hair for days. I put on cologne. I know, I know what you're thinking. Cologne behind thick glass, who's gonna smell it? It's for me, really. Sometimes I tell my wife, I'm wearing cologne. I know she can smell it. After the checkpoint finally opens, we go through a series of holding spaces and wait. Between each room or holding area, we have to go through those metal spoked gates that revolve and can hurt you if you're not careful. Some of the holding areas are outdoors, only partially covered, no chairs, no benches, no place to sit but on the ground or floor. Finally, they herd us into a room with a metal detector and moving belt to x-ray our bags. With soldiers watching through big windows, I show my ID and drop it through a slot to an Israeli officer with rubber gloves, who will run a check on the phone and computer. In a tiny room, they body check me with a wand and their hands. If my bra has metal, I have to take it off. After three or four, maybe five hours, it's nine or 10 or 11 a.m. and we all get taken to wait by the buses. This is the first chance since before 6 a.m to use a restroom. But the only restroom outside here is never cleaned. Never. And most of us find it too disgusting to use. The Israelis don't care. They call us dirty anyways. The next chance will be about three hours away. I lost my voice. I lost my ability to express myself. I look for words, but I stumble and I can't find them. I was a little girl when Israeli soldiers came to the apartment and took my brother. I was 11 years old. I watched them tie his hands and blindfold them. There was nothing I could do. He's always on my mind. When I work, when I play, when I eat or visit friends, I'm constantly wondering if I'm going to get a call that my son has died or been killed in prison. This is with me all the time. It never goes away. I have nightmares and wake up sweating like I'm being taunted or haunted or stabbed in my heart. I live with it physically every day. It's like I'm in prison with him. In Palestine, we're all in prison. The difference between being inside or outside could be nothing. It could be saying the wrong thing, being at the wrong place and breathing the wrong air, riding the wrong bus or taking the wrong road. You can be picked up for nothing, for one reason only. You are the wrong kind of person. 
My son went to preschool in Olympia, Washington. He was bright and energetic and he was black. So he got tracked as one of those kids. Instead of encouraged, he got corrected and taught he would fail. All his life, when he walks out the door, he's a suspect. My son was arrested in April 2002. He was 18 years old. They arrested my husband as well. He was 47. The Israelis arrested all the Palestinian males in our building. This happened all across Ramallah. They took my husband and beat him up and let him go at night in the rain in his underwear to walk the several kilometers home. He had to lie down for several days after. He didn't know until he got home that our son had not been released. It used to be that you might leave your house and not know if you will make it home that day. But now you go to sleep in your house and you don't know if soldiers will break in and take you away in front of your family. It gets so, it's usual, it's normal, it's, it's everyone. It's our life. It's our children's life. Israeli military law makes it so Palestinians can be held for six months without charge or trial. It's called as administrative detention. And they can renew it over and over for years. My son has only been charged, not convicted. He's been in for over a year, but no court date yet. A lot of men in there don't have court dates and they can be held without trial for years. In Israeli prison, they don't bring you enough food. So you can't get by without money from your family. Everything costs money. Soap, toothpaste, a pen, a book, socks, food beyond the little they give him, even the phone or the video visits, and we get cut off because we can't afford the cost. Your family, has already lost a provider. And then they have this monthly expense of having that provider in prison. There's a whole industry that makes a profit from every phone call, every meal, every product that families have to provide. Honestly, if he wouldn't be, he wouldn't be able to survive in there if I didn't provide financial support. I have to take extra contracts, even if I'm tired or exhausted because I'm the only person he has. Nobody understands what it feels like to have a child locked up without speedy trial rights, without safe food or a sky to look at. The drive on the bus is about three hours. The buses don't have restrooms and no stops are allowed. One time, an elderly woman really needed to go to the bathroom, but the driver wasn't allowed to stop. The woman was in such a bad way, the driver phoned and had a whole negotiation with the police to give him a one-time permission to stop so the woman could step off and use the side of the road. But by that time, it was too late, and the woman had soiled herself. You're allowed two letters in a month with a limited number of pages. Two letters are worth a visit. My daughters learned how to fill the page with very tiny handwriting. A letter from the family is worth half a visit, if the letter ever gets here. Once there was a family where no one was allowed to visit the prison except the four-year-old daughter. So she had to make the trip by herself. All the rest of us did our best to take care of the little girl, but she cried all day and night. We saw her another time when other family members had been given a permit, but the little girl screamed and refused to get on that bus again, with, even with her parents. Before his hearing, I would go visit my brother, see him from behind glass. I cried all the way. When they prevented me from visiting, I would cry outside the prison gate. My family would tell me, don't cry, your brother will get upset, or don't cry in front of the soldiers. We don't cry in front of the soldiers. 
On the day of his court, I asked to leave school to see him. A soldier stopped me from entering the courtroom. My mother started screaming at them, but they told her if she didn't stop screaming, they would keep her out too. I watched everyone else go in. Then I went to the soldier and I said, you will always remember that you prevented a young girl from seeing her brother. From that moment on, I felt that this soldier would never be able to scare me again. Our daughter used to do nothing but smile. She still likes to smile and giggle, but now the, st- the smile will stop and a, a sad, worried look will make you forget the smile was ever there. This will happen when soldiers drive by or when the phone rings because it might be her brother from Ashkelon prison. They smuggled a mobile phone into the prison, so sometimes my brother can call. One time I was out and my cell phone rang, but there was no good reception in that spot. I ran all around trying to find some place better, but I couldn't find one, and the ringing stopped. I was meeting with some friends, and I sat down with them. I I didn't want to cry, but I couldn't help it. Sometimes it's even harder when the call comes through. The minute he says, hi, mom, my heart breaks. He was always the source of strength for us. He was the brother who supported his little sister. I remember when he bought a large box of ice cream to hide and we ate it together in his room. I remember one year he worked during the school break and bought me expensive shoes. Those shoes were a treasure for me. I wore them every day until they wore out. He always helps me find my mental balance when it's disturbed. Even when he's in prison, my brother is my strength. For the first few years after he was sentenced, none of us were allowed to visit him except his sister, who was 11 years old. Because she was under 16, she didn't have the compulsory ID card that all Palestinians have to carry. It happens that she was born in Jerusalem, so she could show her birth certificate, and she was allowed to travel across Israel. Every Sunday, this 11-year-old girl would travel for hours across Israel for less than a one hour visit with her brother in prison. When she turned 16, she had to get the Palestinian ID and and that was the end of her visits to her brother. My brother lost a lot of weight after one of the hunger strikes. He suffered from intestinal problems and did not go to the bathroom for more than 10 days. This was the most important topic discussed in our home. My husband is over 45 years old. So even when none of us were allowed, he was supposed to be able to visit our son. He traveled all the way down to Beer Saba in the neck of the desert to see him. When he got there, they told him he couldn't visit after all because like most Palestinian men, he had spent time in prison himself. I had a dream last night. I dreamed I was back in prison. Most times I feel like I'm in a dream and none of this is real. It's like my son has died, but I don't know how to grieve when he's still alive. When holidays come around, I get very depressed. Last year, the entire month of December, I checked out of society. I couldn't face anyone. So I decided to give myself permission to be depressed the entire month. I decided that that would be a form of self-care, to be kind to my mind and body and just feel my feelings. But people can't understand. I feel like the only person I can have this conversation with is my son. My husband is a labor organizer. So Israel put him in prison a bunch of times since the first intifada when our children were very little. He was gone long enough one time that when he came home, our very young daughter didn't know what to call him. She did the best she could and gave him a special name for a while. She called him Amo Baba, which means 
Uncle Daddy. He's been in there more than once. And when he comes out, he comes out worse. He doesn't want to be touched. He's got anger that won't be stopped. He's learned more violence. Whatever values he had, whatever self-care and self-worth he had, whatever ways he had to cope, those get battered. Whatever problems or traumas he had, those get aggravated. Prison is violence. They force him in, they do him harm, and they spit him out, and he comes out the worst version of himself. I'm his mom. I'll never stop loving him for a minute, for an instant. But sometimes I can't take it. Sometimes when he's like that, it's too much for me. My wife is a therapist, but it's hard for her to work because she's experiencing trauma herself. My daughters grow up faster than they want to. They don't like feeling that it's making them tough. They had to work hard to keep hope alive. Nine years, they keep reminding themselves it's better than a sentence for life. My son got COVID-19 in jail. The guards don't wear masks. They go in and out of prison. The whole two weeks he was sick, the jail wouldn't treat him or give him meds until the last three days. He's still dealing with after symptoms. I had nightmares. I would wake up at two or three or six. I was sure he had died from COVID. After the three-hour drive, we get to the prison. They let us off to wait outside on stone benches. It's usually about 1.30 or 2 p.m. And here, the restrooms are usable. This will be my only chance to use a restroom until I get home late at night. In a couple more hours, by 4 p.m. or so, my turn will come for the visit. Ten hours or more since we left home. I'm allowed 45 minutes to speak with my son by telephone on the other side of a glass wall. I fight for every second of those minutes. If the guards turn off the phone line a few seconds early, I fight for those few seconds. Yeah, they do it. They, they, they turn off the, the phone line and I yell at the guards. Hey, open the line back up. I'm still allowed five more seconds. Every day, I wish time would run fast. But during the visit, I wish for the clock to stop. We can't talk about his case or how he's changed because all those calls are recorded. I can't find out if he's really okay, if he's being mistreated or being beat up by the cops in there. In the late evening, 9 or 10 or 11 p.m., the buses drop everyone back at Kalandia checkpoint. And we all find our way home from there using regular cabs or shared service vehicles. For me, that means riding into Ramallah and catching another vehicle to our house, maybe half an hour. For those in the villages, it, it's longer. They might reach home past midnight after one bathroom stop in early afternoon and a whole day and night under guard. When my mother got seriously ill, they granted her ongoing permits to visit her son every two weeks for a period of one year. But she was already weak and it took her days to recover from each visit. So she couldn't do it every time. And sometimes she would have to stay home and be miserable for missing any chance to see him. To the prison way down at Bir Sabah, the trip is longer. More buses go there. More visitors are squeezed into smaller waiting rooms. One room, sometimes they might have 55 visitors waiting in a 15 foot square unventilated space. People get dizzy and faint all the time. Only one bathroom for eight buses full of people. 
sometimes prisoners tell their families not to come visit because they can't stand seeing their families treated like prisoners. Sometimes when I try to walk in the morning or meditate or listen to music, I feel guilty for having these pleasures when my son doesn't even have clean water or healthy food. I give my dog better food than what they get in there. If people knew what was happening in jail, they would be appalled and the system would change. But nobody cares or wants to hear about it and the prisoners are locked up, out of sight, out of mind. If people knew what was happening in jail, they would be appalled and the system would change. Yeah, it could change. The first thing is they could admit that prison is violence. Prison is violence. They could acknowledge that prison is violence against our loved ones and against us when they treat us like not even human and stick their fingers in our mouths or make us take off our underwear and gaslight us every day and tell us our loved ones deserve it. Like telling a woman she deserved it because she wore that dress. Like not even human. They could admit that when black or brown or poor people ask for protection, we don't get it. They could admit that they don't build prisons to keep us safe. They don't build prisons to keep us safe. They could give us back our children. They could give us back our children. They could give us support in our own communities to live and survive and to find ways to hold each other to account. Find ways to hold each other to account in our own communities. If you want to rehabilitate people, you don't lock them up and pass them to the wind. You need to look at what happened to them. You need to give them a way to come back, to re-enter society. We need to build something that doesn't sacrifice our loved ones for profit. We need a new way of thinking about this. A world without prisons? Yes. Prisons will end when occupation and racism end. Our battle is against the whole colonialist project, not just one of its tools. What is needed is the solidarity with the victims in the world victims of colonialism, occupation, racism, injustice. It is no coincidence that during our protest against the police killing of Iyad al-Hallaq in occupied Jerusalem, we raised a picture of George Floyd. On the day they sentenced our son, the military judge told him to stand. He did stand up. He said to them, I'm standing because my parents are here, not for you. I hold no ill will against any Jew or Israeli. I have the right to resist occupation. Your punishment will be like a medal of honor to me. You should put your soldiers and your occupation on trial. Not me. During my mother's illness, even near the end, I was confident that our brother would be with us and that she would not leave us until he returned home. But she's gone. She was 57. When my mother left, my voice left with her. We need a new way of thinking about this. A world without prisons? Yes. I am one of 7,000 Palestinian political prisoners who believe that injustice will fail while liberation and human dignity will be fulfilled. Regardless of how painful it is, we will never deviate from that road. Their occupation and their racist state, no matter how long, is temporary. But our destiny is freedom. Tahiyat ijlal wa ihtiram li kull al asra wa al asirat fi sujoon al ihtilal wa lil asra dawil bashra al samra fi sujoon al amerikiya. 
قلوبنا معكم ولا بد للقيد أن ينكسر حرية الأسرة من حرية الشعب ويبقى المستقبل واعدا فالأمل يولد الأمل